Good morning, and welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ. This is August 1st. It's the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, and thanks to Arlene for uh, getting us started today. I am uh, not portraying a medical professional. What I am portraying is a potter's wheel helper. Certainly not the potter, because... I just helped, and uh, we met a lot of nice kids today during Bible school, and Bible school goes again um, next week, and if you have kids or grandkids that you'd like to have attend and have a great time, uh, come on down is uh, what we like to say, so uh, Marketplace will continue. Uh, a report on the um, Riley Victory Garden, so many tomatoes so little time but uh, the Rileys have brought us uh, freshly picked tomatoes and uh, take them home with you uh, as you you leave and they'll bring more okay so that'll be kind of good uh, a reminder if um, you are following the calendar from the newsletter the evangelism and membership committee meets the second Monday not the first Monday of the month um, thanks ahead to Larry Marchino and Bruce Hatton. I'm going to play the, the music with the real music. Sorry, Arlene. They got the guitars out today, and they'll be our, our special music, and we're uh, really happy uh, for that today. The media consent form is <clears throat> available for folks to uh, look over and sign if uh, they would like. Go ahead. I can't hear you. I need a microphone to hear. I failed to put this out, but we are gleaning again um, this Tuesday, 1030. So if you can come out and help us, and I'm caught in my earring. <laughs> if you can come out and help us, uh, we would much appreciate it. We are gleaning this last week. We sent to Helping His Hands and to the food pantry. No, food pantry this week. Last week was Helping His Hands. Um, and then always to uh, places in St. Louis that can take it. So we, they just tell us what we need from different places, Helping His Hands and food pantry in St. Louis. And we deliver whatever they can get because there is food out there going to waste. So uh, if you can help and you're not allergic to corn, <laughs> come on out. Um, we bag potatoes and harvest the corn. And I think every week we've gotten over 100 dozen ears of corn and uh, several hundred pounds of potatoes. So we are sending a lot of food out and a lot of people are very appreciative. Thank you, Janet. A uh, block party coming October 3rd, 4 to 6 p.m. that uh, we're going to sponsor to have some fun and greet our neighbors from the physical neighborhood here. So you might want to mark that down. Also, welcome to uh, all our guests today, including um, Reverend Trevor Murray, who was with us last week, but he's going to also, we're happy to have him come back this week. Uh, right now, if you could stand and, and do greetings, that would be just fantastic.
please join me in the call to worship. You call your people to prayer and praise in many ways. This day, bring us together, just as you called the people of Israel to gather manna in the desert to eat and to sustain life. God of unity, give us this day our daily bread. Offer us the nutrients we need to remain connected to you. As spiritual beings, we desire to receive food that endures faith and hope and love. God of grace, Give us this day our daily bread. All life is created and nourished by you. Holy Spirit, come. Give us this day our daily bread. Please join me in this invocation. Life sustainer, we receive the things you desire to offer us today and each new day. Grant us wisdom and openness to your word and use its teachings to energize our bodies and spirits. Inspire us the faith and courage to act upon your word. Amen.
Sorry, it takes just a minute to get things going here. all know who I am. This is Bruce Hatton. Bruce and I go way back. Uh, I think we, we first met in grade school when he started moving from Freelandville area to the Fritchton School. And we played uh, baseball, basketball, rode bicycles, motorcycles together, along with motorbikes together. And, and uh, we played music together in high school. And then after about 50 years, we didn't see each other, but just occasionally. And then uh, we're back together again. So it's, uh, it's been a lifelong friendship. So anyway, we're going to do one for you here. That it's, a, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. And uh, it's one we like called Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransomed will shine, I want to go. Silver line, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never go, and someday.
just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the Someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land. Someday under, we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as We'll walk on streets that are pure as Thank you, Larry and Bruce, um, and younger kids. That's what a guitar is supposed to sound like. <laughs> it's time for our Especially for Children feature. something to get water from. And back in Bible times, in Jesus times, they didn't have running water like we do now. We can go turn a faucet on and get a drink of water or wash your face or brush your teeth or whatever we need to do. But in those times, they had to go to the well and draw their water with a bucket out of the well so they could have fresh water for what they needed for baking and drinking and, and all of that. So we decided since we were going to have our story time during church for the next four Sundays, we have a well so we could gather around the well and tell stories. All right? But I also want you to notice something else is up. There are some banners around the well, and these banners represent the tribes. Now, there were 12 tribes, um, and they were sons of Jacob. But if you count, there's not 12 banners up there. How many banners do you see? There's only nine. Well, the other three are upstairs because you are going to make up the other three tribes, okay? So you'll see those banners when we go upstairs. But what's cool about this is Jacob had 12 sons, and each of his sons became the name of a tribe, okay? And each one of these had the sons' names on them and a symbol for that person. Now, having come from the same family, do you think all the brothers were the same? Are you the same as your brother and sister? 
We'll do the offering prayer in unison. God of wonders, who enabled Jesus to feed the multitudes, bless these gifts and use them to fill empty stomachs and empty hearts. May our offerings be multiplied to abundantly nourish all people. Our scripture this morning is taken from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, 
starting at the 24th verse and going to the 35th. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that the God, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good to be back. I think this thing is kind of flying all over the place. Probably need to tape it to my head or something. Uh, where are our musicians? Hey, good job, you guys. That was really lovely. Can we give them another round of applause? Because it was really good. <clears throat> Um, that stuff's not easy to do, by the way, and they did it really, really, really well. It gave me um, some, uh, what's his name? Marty Robbins vibes, right? With the exception that at the end of the song, everyone was still alive, <laughs> right? I like Marty Robbins, but man, whew, it gets pretty dark. That's good music, right? So, last week we had the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And um, today is the follow-up from that, that the people have followed Jesus across the lake because uh, he gave them free food. And uh, Jesus calls them out on it. He said, you followed me because you gave me food, but you're kind of missing the point. And so then he proceeds to tell them what the point is. And it culminates in the very last line when he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and who believes in me will never thirst. All right, what does that mean? The job of a preacher is not only to console and to uplift, but sometimes it's to challenge as well. So last week was kind of the uplifting part, Today I'm going to challenge you, all right? So I'm going to give you the, the fair, fair warning ahead of time, all right? Um, to introduce this, I want to tell you a quick story. And forgive me if I've told you the story before because I forget what I've talked about and what I haven't. And I have been here enough that I may have started <laughs> repeating myself. So I apologize if that's the case. When I was uh, a seminary student, I had the opportunity to go to Zimbabwe and South Africa. And it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to visit some of the Catholic missions that were in those countries. And the idea was we send these future priests to these missions so that when they are priests in the parish, they can talk with firsthand experience about where the money is going that is raised for these various missions. And it was, it was a very great program. I really enjoyed uh, that opportunity. Needless to say, it was eye-opening on many levels. And we visited a number of, of different uh, missions at that time. And one of them 
uh, was a village. I'm going to talk about two particular visits that we had. One was a village, and um, they would tell stories by putting on plays. So they, they put on a play for us to tell the story of their village and what had happened to them and why there was a mission there helping this group of people. They told us the story through this dramatic action that their entire livelihood uh, prior to this was uh, sourced by a river that came through their village. They would fish from it, draw water from it, bathe in it. Their entire livelihood depended upon this river that came through their village. What had happened was the local government came in and told them that their river was going to be dammed up to create a lake that would provide electricity for the local town, the local city. It meant that their entire way of life was going to be gone, which meant that now they were walking five miles or so to dig in the mud to get water, even to survive. So as they were putting on this drama for us, they were telling us about the visit of the city officials who came to give the news. They acted out their listening to the news that was given. And they continued to act out the play. And then the actions became increasingly violent. And there was much sort of screaming and waving of hands. And the interpreter said, now the villagers are acting out what they prayed for when this village, the government officials left their village. They were praying that the van that they were driving would drive off a cliff and that they would all die a fiery, painful death. <laughs> I thought, well, wow, I'm so glad that Christianity is coming to this village and has really taken root in uh, this particular Catholic mission. Wasn't that great? <laughs> Seriously, this was what they were acting out. And I thought, wow, um, wow, we've got a lot of work to do uh, in, this, in this particular village. But the joke was on me because in that same visit, later that week, we visited uh, an orphanage this is pretty sad. It was an orphanage of children wh whose parents all who had died of AIDS. So the entire orphanage was filled with children like this. We were visiting one of the classrooms, and the teacher, who was uh, one of the women from one of the local villages, introduced us as American seminarians, men who were studying to be priests. And she said, and I will never forget this, these men come from the country whose culture is making us increasingly violent and who is promoting death in our culture. I had just placed judgment on this village who didn't seemingly get the message of Christianity when within a couple of days the finger was pointed back at me and my own culture by this woman who says, you know all those movies you watch where people are being violent? These are the guys who brought you that. That was very, very, very humbling. And when I first had that experience of the villagers praying for the van to go off the cliff, I was thinking, what is the relationship of the gospel message in that culture? And how is it that there can be a coexistence of faith and in learning about Jesus and this group of people who were praying to their gods, plural, for the death of people from this government? How can those two things coexist in the minds and hearts of these people. But we do this ourselves, don't we? The gospel always coexists inside of culture. It coexists in culture, which 
we often don't even think about or challenge the things that sometimes don't always go hand in hand with the gospel. So today, the challenge is, where do we find the things in our own lives and in our own belief systems that need to be challenged? When the people in the gospel ask Jesus, what sign are you going to work for us? What is the sign that you are doing for us? In the Gospel of John, the, John, the Gospel of John is broken up into several different books. They are different books of different signs. But do you know what the ultimate sign is for John? It's Jesus' death upon the cross. The ultimate act of nonviolence and of laying down his life. When Jesus tells us today that he is the bread of life and that we will never hunger if we follow him and believe in him, what does he in fact mean? What is the challenge if we follow that way of life? I used to joke whenever I was a priest, I liked to hear confessions, right? Not because I have, you know, some sick fascination with that, but that I wanted people to have the opportunity to experience God's forgiveness in the sacrament of confession. So I made it available all the time. Before every Mass, I would be in the confessional at least 45 minutes ahead of time. So people had the opportunity to come and talk if they wanted to. And you know who the Maytag repairman is? Who sits around and waits for things and nothing happens? That's what I did in the confessional. (laughs) You know, the Maytag repairman is waiting for something to break but it doesn't break because it's not broken, right? That's what it was like sitting in the confessional. So I assumed nobody's sinning, right? And everybody's doing great. And I think we have gotten into the practice of saying, we look at the commandments and we say, hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm not really breaking any of those. I'm in good shape, right? But what Jesus brings is a deeper challenge. It's not simply to keep the rules, but to be challenged to do other things on top of what you are avoiding, right? In the Catholic Church and in the Episcopal faith, and I think probably in the Lutheran faith as well, at the beginning of every ceremony, you ask forgiveness of God not only of the things that you have done, but also the things that you have left undone. And for many of us, the challenge is to think about the things that we have left undone in our lives. And the deepest challenge is not to look at the commandments, but in fact, the Beatitudes. When's the last time you challenge yourself to say, have I treasured being poor and simple in my life? Have I sought out those who mourn to comfort them? Have I sought to be meek? Have I hungered and thirst for righteousness? Have I been merciful? Have I been pure of heart? Have I been a peacemaker? These are the challenges that Jesus offers us. And when he tells you that when you follow him, you will not hunger or thirst, he's meaning if you challenge yourself to live that stuff, That's a different way of life. It's going to be challenged by our culture, wherever we are, because human beings don't think like that. And that's why Christianity is hard. But what's the the upshot? Because when I was in school, they said, always leave people with good news. Don't preach the bad news, right? I've laid down the challenge. Why do we want to do this? Let's stick with the Johannine Corpus. The Johannine Corpus is the body of writing that is attributed to the Apostle John, right? So, from that same body of literature, we have the first letter of John. The beginning of the first letter of John should be read often because it's a reminder to what we own as Christians and what we get from it when we follow these challenges that Jesus gives us. Here are the words that I'll leave you with. We declare to you what has been from the beginning, 
what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes and looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And here's the last line I want to leave you with. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So we come before you now, Lord, and we bring our prayers and our petitions. We come before you, keeping in mind our country this day. We ask for peace, Lord, in all of its places. We pray for those who help to preserve our peace, that you will bless them and keep them safe this day. Let us pray for our church throughout the world, for the body of believers, that we might truly be challenged to live the Beatitudes, and by doing so, bring joy to our lives and joy to those around us. And may that joy radiate from the smiles on our faces. We pray for this city and for uh, all those who lead us. We pray for justice and peace in our community. And we pray for this church, that the Lord will build it up in number and in spirit. We pray for those who are sick, especially amongst our family and friends, all the patients at Good Samaritan Hospital, and all those who take care of them, especially during this resurgence of the COVID-19. We ask that the Lord send good workers to take care of those who are sick. We pray for all of us here, for our family members, for the things that we keep in our hearts that we know that we need from you, Lord, to give us the strength and the courage to carry on in the midst of hardship, knowing that your grace will carry us through all of these things. And we now pause to bring our own petitions and our own needs before the Lord. <clears throat> bringing all our prayers and praises into one, we bind them together with the words that, our son, that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you, upon those you love, and upon those for whom you would pray this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.